Hello, I'm Ed Zimmer, recently retired from Lincoln City Planning Department, and I'm going to present for the Preservation Association of Lincoln a program I'm calling Exploring Ellis. This is about an Iowa architect who became a Nebraska architect and had some very significant work in Lincoln, Nebraska. And we'll claim him as our own before we're done here. Frank M. Ellis, or F. M. Ellis, he usually went by, um, but his name was Francis. I was born in 1837 in New York State. He married Martha Davis in 1862 and first shows up in the censuses as a house carpenter in Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania. We wouldn't think that's going to be the man who ends up designing our Lancaster County Courthouse, but stay with me. In the 1870s, uh, for several years, he works as a builder, carpenter, and principally like a contractor in Chicago. And that seems to be what really launches him to greater heights and probably greater ambitions. Uh, busy time in Chicago, lots of building activity going on. And about 1876, he leaves Chicago and travels to Marshalltown, Iowa, and announces himself as an architect. It might make us wonder what training has he had? As far as we know, it was just what I've outlined. He was a carpenter in Pennsylvania and a contractor in Chicago. Um, but he must have had um, charm, and we know he had design skills from what we see of his subsequent work. By 1879, Iowa newspapers are crediting him with two dozen buildings uh, in the uh, Marshalltown area and beyond. He particularly concentrates in his early years on opera houses, and we'll look at one that still stands, but eventually he does about um, eight or nine opera houses, including ones in Des Moines, Oskaloosa, Marshalltown, Cedar Rapids, Peoria, Illinois, um, stepping outside Iowa, Newton, Iowa, here in South Dakota, and then Fremont, Nebraska, where it still stands, and one in Sac City, Iowa. One of the earliest houses we know of uh, still surviving of his work, because he did a lot more work than we still have around, uh, is the Rankin House in Parkersburg, Iowa. It's about 1883, and it's listed on the National Register of Historic Places, and it still stands, although obviously its porch has lost a lot of its decoration. Um, but a, a quite a lavish house inside and out. Then by, by 1873, still in Marshalltown, he undertakes three major projects in Lincoln, Nebraska. And as far as I can tell, these are his first Nebraska projects, although he works in other communities as well. And we'll look at those projects because they really are what bring him to our attention and let us lay claim to him as a Nebraska, um, particularly a Lincoln architect. This is not one of the major projects. Uh, he, um, while he's building the first congregational church, he consults with Fred Funk, or Funky, I'm not sure which, um, about an addition to Funky's Opera House. This stood at 12th and O, um, earlier it had been called the Centennial Opera House and still had that name on it, but Funky had put his name at the top as well. And what Ellis was doing was consulting about making an addition. And if that's the part built, it would be this um, bay to the south end of the old opera house uh, with the arched windows, the big, big wide arched windows. That I think is Ellis's addition to uh, Funky's Opera House. I also love this image of those grand staircases. Um, that's, that's a serious fire escape from each level and lots of width and um, ample opportunity. Opera houses could be scary places. The earlier version of this opera house had burned down on this site and the um, Centennial Funky Opera House was its replacement. The more important projects um, Ellis undertook in Lincoln uh, in 1883, where the Richards Block at 11th and O, northeast corner, um, this handsome building with that nifty Oriel uh, rising into a, a spire uh, on the corner. Look a little closer at it. Uh, this is the 1889 view of a building that was just uh, about five or six years old when this photo was taken. Unfortunately, this building 
um, look at it as the O Street front as well. Unfortunately, Richard's block was one of the major fires in Lincoln of 1899, and the building was destroyed and replaced with the new Richard's block, also at 11th and O. And this building still stands, although it's not very recognizable. This is not Ellis's work, but the replacement of about 1900. Now it's all wrapped in limestone, and you might recognize it as the location of the Dish restaurant on the corner. The other major pro another major project of 1883 for Ellis in Lincoln was First Congregational Church. Uh, shared the block face on, south, on the west side of 13th between L and M with First Presbyterian Church. Uh, this one was unusual in that it took its entrance on a diagonal right at the corner. Uh, and this is one of Ellis's major projects in Lincoln. This church becomes the founding church with Plymouth Congregational of today's first Plymouth when Cornesker Hotel buys the site of uh, the two churches that stood on this corner and the old Cornhusker is built, but this is where the new Cornhusker stands. So the, the Miller Time pub is right on this corner uh, where the Congregational Churches was. And then the biggest project that Ellis undertook at this time uh, in Lincoln was the State Insane Asylum. Now we call it the Regional Center out west of town, but El there also had been an earlier building on this site that burned down, and Ellis designed this huge, addition, huge replacement uh, for the state um, hospital for the mentally ill. And then a minor project of these years, um, his, Ellis's early work uh, in Lincoln, was the house that Mrs. C.C. C. White occupied in the early 20th century, but it was built in the 1880s for J.E. Houts, Houts was the president of Lincoln National Bank, and his house stood at 713 F Street, or the, cor the southeast corner of 17th and F, um, just south of where First Presbyterian Church is today. And this was uh, Ellis's work of 1885, described as a Queen Anne uh, frame and shingle house. And at the time it was announced, it was also said that a house same and same, meaning I assume Queen Anne, frame and shingle, uh, was being built for F. Neely in Waterloo, Iowa. Um, I haven't been able to find Neely's house still standing and this one is gone as well. Mrs. White, a few years after living here, moves out and builds Whitehall uh, in the University Place neighborhood. With all that work going on in Nebraska and particularly uh, in Lincoln, Ellis leaves Iowa in 1885 and relocates to Omaha um, and makes that his um, permanent location for the rest of his uh, practice. At that time, he's building um, not only these Lincoln projects, but also an asylum for the state of Nebraska in Norfolk. And there becomes a newspaper battle between the Lincoln paper, the Nebraska State Journal, predecessor to Journal Star, and the Omaha Bee. The Omaha Bee is publishing articles from Norfolk saying that the foundations for the Norfolk building might be inadequate, the materials are bad, the sand they're using is dirty, and probably it should all be torn down. Um, the Lincoln paper uh, refutes all this and says there's no need for Mr. Ellis to be distressed about the Bee charges. They are the inevitable inheritance of every man in Nebraska who has any relations with the public and does not pay tribute to the bee. Whether it's tribute to the bee or not, Mr. Ellis starts advertising in the bee very regularly, just in the same month that this exchange is going on between the Lincoln and Omaha papers. And every day then for months to come, Ellis and company advertise their business in the Omaha bee uh, for the Omaha and Des Moines offices. You'll notice at the bottom of this ad for Ellis and Company, it says George Berlinghoff, misspelled on the Berlinghoff, is also with F.M. Ellis. George Berlinghoff was the German-born architect who had recently arrived in Nebraska and early, early in his career uh, was associated in the office with Ellis. Ellis also was employing, first in Marshalltown and then comes to Omaha uh, in the office, uh, John Latenzer. 
a very prominent Omaha architect uh, and another credit to Ellis's impact in Nebraska that both Berlinghoff and Latenzer, who build uh, innumerable uh, major projects throughout the state and throughout the region, uh, were both in Ellis's office at this early time. Now the Norfolk Asylum that uh, had been the subject of that argument back and forth between the newspapers um, burned down in 1901, so we don't have great images of it, but this was um, another of the major state projects that Ellis had undertaken. About the same time, 1885, um, he's still doing work in Iowa, even though he's um, moving from Marshalltown to Omaha, and the First Presbyterian Church in Marion, Iowa, um, still standing, a beautiful stone church, is Ellis's work. While back in Nebraska, in Omaha, no, no, this one is in Kearney. Um, Ellis somehow has the ability both from Marshalltown and once in Omaha uh, to obtain a lot of the major state commissions in the late 1880s. And he designs the, what was called the in Boys Industrial School, the Boys Reform uh, School in Kearney of 1885. Almost has a little bit of Prairie School feel to it, but uh, that probably would be would be reaching for me to claim that. In Lincoln, at the same time, he does another state project of the Home for the Friendless. Um, he does, I think, that larger addition to the left side. Uh, this was a uh, home for orphans and unwed mothers at 11th and South Street, where Lancaster uh, Rehab uh, Facility now stands. Also in 1885-86, uh, Ellis gets a project all the way in the western edge, edge of the state um, at Sydney, Nebraska. In 86-87, he designs Christ Episcopal Church. Uh, it has had several additions, including that little red door to entry, um, but very much in the spirit of this uh, kind of combination of a stone foundation with a um, sort of shingle-style uh, building above it. This church was associated with Company I of the 21st Infantry, which was a very uh, noteworthy uh, historic infantry company. Uh, largely, the enlisted men were Native Americans uh, with uh, European American officers, and they attended this church in the 1890s um, after the company was stationed at Sydney. And there were services held in this church in both English and Lakota. It's on the National Register of Historic Places, both for the architecture and particularly for the association uh, with Company I. In Omaha, uh, Ellis is doing a lot of major work, some of it still standing. Uh, the Millard Block um, at 11th and Harney Streets, 1887, commercial building. Big Brownell Hall, uh, later Grace Bible Institute of 1886-87 at 1509 South 10th. And then his um, major project that's gonna move us from 1885 into the later 1880s um, is back in Lincoln. This is an 1887 map of Lincoln uh, showing the growth of the community at that time, but also up at the top we get some nice images of buildings. Um, this map was printed by George or G. A. Bush in 1887 uh, for, or at least carried the advertisement of a realtor, uh, B. Cox. And on the left side of the image, there's Cox. Left side of the image is the new state capitol building just being finished up um, at that time. But on the right side of the image is what ought to be, uh, even if you track Lincoln history pretty closely, an unfamiliar view of the Lancaster County Courthouse because this is not the one built. But in 1887, uh, following a competition in 1885, this was the design that was being bid for construction it was designed by a Detroit architect, Elijah E. Myers, a very successful figure who actually did the initial designs at least for four state capitals, Michigan, Texas, um, Idaho Territory, and Colorado. Um, he also was fired from at least two of those capital projects before they were finished, uh, was a um, rather controversial figure. Um, having trouble bringing in his big projects under bid, or within the bids. Uh, and let me read you a little bit of how a student scholar of the Texas Capitol 
described our Mr. Meyer. Some of the, sometimes the writing is just as colorful as the buildings. Um, this is a architectural historian, Paul Goldner, and he studied the, described the process of building the um, Texas Capitol. And Goldner points out several important buildings of Meyer's design have survived to prove his ability as an architect. They include state capitals in Michigan, Texas, and Colorado, courthouses in Macomb, Carlettville, Galesburg, Illinois, the Richmond City Hall, and Central Methodist Episcopal Church in Lansing. Their architect was talented, dishonest, hardworking, spiteful, clever, unbalanced, self-assured, self-destructive hypochondriac whose story must be pieced together from fragments. He will always be somewhat mysterious, evasive, and much more interesting than any of his more conventional contemporaries. So that's the man who didn't build the Lancaster County Courthouse, but won the design um, until it proved to be far too expensive to build. Um, Meyer did have a, quite an impact in Nebraska. I'll mention it just briefly. He designed the B Building, um, out of which the Omaha Bee newspaper came in Omaha in 1886 to 89. It stood next to the Grand City Hall. Meyer actually got the, con got the commission for the City Hall, but that proved too expensive, and different architects built this grand building. But Meyer did get the commission for the Douglas County Courthouse that stood just across the street from City Hall and the B Building, and that one was built. Um, so he had quite, a, quite an impact on Nebraska architecture, but not the Lancaster County Building. So I'll, I'll go from Meyer's design. Ellis had competed for the commission in 1885 uh, when this project failed and they reopened um, the competition in 1887. Our Mr. Ellis was chosen. And so that's where he really lays claim to being a Lincoln architect uh, because he's selected to design the Grand Las Lancaster County Courthouse that stood right where we are filming today, um, on the north end of the block between 9th and 10th at K Street. Ellis's design looked like this, no small building either, but it did come in within the bids for the project, and also demonstrates that Ellis and his office, because by this time he's got a draftsman working with him, uh, could produce very competent designs and very elegant drawings. Now, this drawing survives at uh, history in Nebraska in the archives. Here's the Lancaster County Courthouse as finished um, about 1889 uh, with a tall statue standing atop it that I'll refer to in just a minute. Uh, this is a very, um, I can't resist this image just because it's so funky a presentation of major public buildings, but it also says right below the courthouse that it is designed by um, our FM Ellis, and um, dancing in the sky above it, the State and Sustain Asylum and the Penitentiary, um, and that uh, State Asylum was an Ellis building as well. Courthouse featured in a uh, rather unusual snow scene postcard, and I can't resist postcards of buildings, but also this early view showing the courthouse with uh, Lincoln floating in the uh, sky above it because that was the statue standing atop the building. Uh, it was a um, not a bronze like the sower on the Capitol, not as durable or as skilled to work as that one, uh, but a um, copper construction that did not survive, nor did the tower survive before the building was torn down in the 1960s to build uh, the current um, sequence of buildings that become the county city complex. Uh, the tower and the statue had both been lost. Now for some Ellis buildings that do stand. We've, we've gone a long ways through a lot of major and important buildings uh, without seeing one still standing. Um, but we do have in Nebraska uh, some fabulous Ellis buildings and we'll begin with the um, Love Larson Opera House in Fremont. This was Ellis's work in 1888 when his, he's now well established in Omaha. Uh, and just a spectacular building um, at 545 Broad Street, uh, still in beautiful uh, restored condition. So we'll look at it in color as well. Uh, 
and still retains uh, its wonderful uh, name plaque and fancy uh, ornament at the cornice. While in Fremont, there are several projects that uh, Ellis undertakes and several that still stand, and they include the McDonald House, and this is at the corner of uh, D Street and East Military. A fabulous Queen Anne um, brick mansion. When I undertook to learn a little bit more about Ellis, I was wishing I could find one new Ellis, uh, although he died 130, 120 years ago. Uh, this building, listed on the National Register of Historic Places, um, had been identified with a different architect or a, a different name, uh, M. A. Ecker, uh, who turned out to be probably the stone contractor in a different spelling. Uh, William A. Ecker uh, was the stone contractor for this building. But a newspaper account of February eight, 1888 notes that J.D. McDonald will open the building season of 1888 in Fremont by construction of a splendid brick residence on the site of his present residence, corner of Military and D Streets. The plan is being perfected by F.M. Ellis of Omaha. So we can uh, with confidence claim this as Ellis's work in Fremont. And we'll take a close look at this because it's still there and still in lovely condition. Um, it's been many things, a uh, design studio, a mortuary, and currently is a doctor's office uh, who maintains it in beautiful condition. And we have wonderful uh, masonry, this, this Byzantine style arch over one of the front windows and lovely uh, leaded glass as well. Lots of decorative shingle work, decorative masonry. And then this beautiful tower uh, on a corner that by that stair step of arched windows tells us it's, it contains the staircase within uh, and then goes up almost in a lighthouse fashion uh, to a uh, little circular room and a conical t uh, roof above. Uh, beautiful spindle work on the uh, double story front porch. And then that great tower and just a really fun uh, step of beautiful stained glass windows uh, with little um, wall mounted sconces between them. Um, and some fascinating uh, decorative carving in the stonework. I thought about trying to make an appointment to visit this doctor, but didn't think that really would be fair, but I'd love to look out through those windows sometime. This, this building also, uh, in its um, completion, uh, was subject of a wonderful article uh, in the Fremont paper. Uh, about the lavish interior, and we can almost in that article march our way through the interior, but since I don't have slides of that, I won't just read your way through the interior. But they do talk about the lovely trysting space up in that little um, circular room uh, in the tower, a cozy trysting space that sounds awfully nice. Beautiful windows all around the house, beautiful brickwork. This is um, Dr. Bryce Lund's Nephrology Care LLC building today, uh, and we're fortunate that he's maintaining it so well. And then just down the street from uh, McDonald House is the William um, D. L. Freeman House at 534 East Military Avenue, um, a frame Queen Anne house, not nearly as as fanciful, but still lots of good surviving original material. And the Fremont Tribune of March 1888 noted that plans and elevations for another fine residence have been prepared by architect Ellis to be placed on the stone foundation built some time since by Mr. Freeman. So apparently the project had begun and then stalled and Ellis fit his building on top of an existing foundation. Very handsome house among um, nice houses, but quite a bit later 
construction to either side of it on military. Ellis also gets another state project here in Omaha, um, Institute for what was called um, Institute for the Deaf and Dumb, um, hearing and speaking impaired individuals. Um, and this was built in Omaha in the late 1880s. And then um, additions to the Hastings Asylum. On the left side of this view, the original building uh, was sort of this reverse E-shaped plan and then wings were put uh, at either end of it, uh, north and south, and those wings were Ellis's work of about 1889. And we see those wings um, to either side um, of this, matching closely the original construction. Back in Omaha, um, Ellis did a huge amount of work, not much of it still extant. Um, this house is lost, but it was a fabulous house built for Henry Yates um, in 1887, 1889 uh, at 3120 Davenport Street. And for many years after was a uh, fraternity house for medical students uh, at Creighton University, uh, now replaced, although some of the stones uh, still stand between the apartment buildings on the house site. And then finally, um, to buttress my claim that we can call him a Lincoln architect, uh, not just in the buildings he designed, but also in 1890, he's, Ellis is advertising offices in Omaha, which remains his main location. But for that one single year of 1890, also in Lincoln and in Council Bluffs. And if we look at the 1890 city directory, we see Ellis listed among the nine architects um, and, or architects and architectural firms practicing in Lincoln at the time, um, familiar names. But also note that four of those nine are listing their location as O1204. 1204 O Street was what we call the Burr Block. Uh, today, in much remodeled form, uh, we would call it Center Stone. But um, look at all of those you know, fully four-ninths of almost half of Lincoln Ar Lincoln's architects at that time have their offices in the same building. Um, that was this lovely building, not designed by any of those, but one of the others on the list, um, James Tyler, designed the Burr Block. And this is Tyler's fanciful drawing for that very fanciful building. Uh, lo lovely, you can see Burr's Block uh, in the stonework right above the arched entrance. because it was two Burr brothers who built it. So while we would tend to call it Burr block, it was Burr's in the drawing. Here's 1889 view of the building. And if we look at the top floor, that's where, as far as we can identify, the architects were officing um, because um, Craddock and Hayes and uh, Ferdinand C. Fisk both are listed in the city directory that year as having room numbers on the sixth floor, the top floor of the building. Um, there's not an identification in the directory of what Ellis's room number was. And it makes me suspect, at least, that he may have had an office of convenience with one of the other architects, that rather than maintaining separate operation, that he had a workspace of some kind. Um, Co-working, we might call it, uh, but sharing an office probably uh, with Fisk um, be rather likely, or it could have been Craddock and Hayes. Another um, building still extant, uh, and this one drawing Ellis uh, back to his uh, growing practice uh, in Lincoln, Omaha, and Council Bluffs, is uh, the church now called Broadway Methodist Church uh, in, in Broad. Um, on Broadway in Council Bluffs. The spire obviously is, has been changed, but uh, the Ellis design uh, still stands. Uh, this is an 1890 church uh, and quite a handsome one um, of that time. At this time, uh, Ellis had a partner, uh, or at least an associate, a young associate named Kent, uh, who was doing work on this church. And there's quite a bit of newspaper discussion back and forth about 
was this Ellis's work or Kent's and were they still associated? Um, Kent left the Ellis practice um, and I think this project um, became uh, somewhat of a tug of war between who was finishing it up. Um, but since the church building committee were pressing Mr. Ellis hard to turn over the drawings to them, they must have been building Ellis's drawings because that's why they wanted them. Um, and there's, there are beautiful windows in that church. And I always like when I ever have an opportunity um, to end one of these presentations with beautiful stained glass windows, but I'm not quite at the end. Uh, I have to bring you the last major project um, I could find for Mr. Ellis, and that was the Taylor County Courthouse in Bedford, Iowa, 1892-93. Uh, this is taking us right up to the um, panic of 1893 that pretty much ends construction um, around the country, and particularly in Nebraska and Iowa for a few years. Um, Bedford is about 115 miles east of Lincoln, but a good 100 miles southeast of Omaha. And Ellis was practicing and visiting the construction sites typically uh, throughout the region as he did these major projects. Uh, here's the um, Taylor County Courthouse today, uh, said to have been built for about $40,000, which would be uh, quite a bargain. And we can see relations between this building and the McDonald um, House with those uh, nice, here we have a pair of the conical towers uh, and or the conical roofs over the circular uh, towers, but then also the main clock tower uh, rising above. Finally, Ellis um, is an invalid in the late 1890s, um, is taken to his bed in Omaha um, from about 1896 on, um, and then dies um, of heart attack in 1899 in Omaha. He still had a family connection back to Marshalltown um, and his widow, um, interred his body uh, with uh, orders of his, the rites of his fraternal order back at uh, Riverside Cemetery in Marshalltown. She lived on in Omaha a couple more years and died in 1901 and is also interred. Uh, their gravestone um, is in that cemetery in Marshalltown, which answered the question I started with on Ellis of when was he born? And I take 1837, the date on his gravestone um, as his date of birth. That is our New York born, Iowa bred, um, but heavily practiced in Nebraska, Frank F.M. Ellis. Now I would take questions, but I have no audience because this is, this is that time of a quarantined presentation. Thank you.